During the World Cup, I realized it's a real sacrifice for a lot of people. And I appreciate all the sacrifice that, that people uh, have made to be here. And I realize that some are not here, and may the Lord repay them accordingly. That's all I can say. But it's, it's, it's good. It's good that we can uh, come together. It's good that we can spend some time together. You know, we've, we've been going on a journey now, and today is the last week that we began 12 weeks ago as we've been going gently but consistently and diligently through what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount... Is, is something that Jesus gave us. It covers Matthew chapters 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And as he went through all of these chapters, as he was going, he was talking and he was giving us some very clear and specific things about how life worked best, how life was designed to work, and how both he and us can make it work. Over the course of this time, we have seen, I'm sorry, do we have it or we've not found it yet? Haven't found it, okay? Then just follow me. You can write without seeing it. Over the past 11 weeks, E. Stanley Jones told us at the very beginning, he said, this is not a sermon. This is not a sermon. It's a portrait. And it's a portrait of Jesus himself, and by being a portrait of Jesus, it's a portrait of God the Father, because Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So what we learn from Jesus, now we know God better because of that. He said, we have a portrait of Jesus, of the Father, and this is the one I really like, and of the man to be. In other words, this is who mankind was created to be, and more importantly, Jesus, as he spoke to those that were listening to him right there, said, this is how you can be. This is how you can live. This is not just some pie-in-the-sky thing. This is really who it is. This is really who you were designed to be and can be as long as Jesus is living through you. Now, as we come to the last two verses of Matthew chapter 7, here's what we read. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. In other words, as Jesus is teaching them, they're seeing something different. And at the end of the sermon, what, what gets their attention the most is this saying, who was or who is this teacher? Who is it? Who is this person that is teaching us because his teaching is different than everybody else? As I've been Going through, I've told you that I've been reading a couple of books, one on the Sermon on the Mount by John Stott, and the other one, the philosophy, A Working Philosophy of Life by E. Stanley Jones, both covering these passages. And one of them said the following, As the crowd listened to Jesus on the hillside, the impression he left on them was not that they were listening to an impossible dreamer, or a detached mystic who had no touch with reality. On the contrary, they were impressed with his sanity and spiritual authoritativeness. As he talked, they felt that the old world they had lived in, built on greed and selfishness, was the unreal, and that this new world that Jesus was presenting was the only solid reality. They felt the difference. The scribes taught rules of religion, but Jesus taught them. Jesus did not teach principles. Jesus taught persons. Those that heard felt the difference by its warmth and authority. Again, the scribes quoted authorities. Jesus spoke out of the authority 
of living reality. In the words of the scribes, they heard the voice of the past. But in the words of Jesus, they heard the voice that assumed control over the past, the present, and the future. I want you to write this down because this is very important. Jesus had and has real authority. Jesus has real authority. When we get to the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Here he's talking about saying this is like the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. In other words, he is the Christ of the beginnings, and he is the Christ of of the final word. What amazing, these beginnings. Write this down. He spoke these words, these great words on the mount and lived them, every one of them and more. It's one thing to say something and it's something else to live it. Let, let, let's stop and think about this. Every politician says tremendous things. Would you agree with that? Well, some don't, but most politicians say amazing things. The problem is they seldom live up to their words. We can make a lot of promises with our lips. We can, we can espouse and we can talk about great and lofty things with our lips, but it's another thing to do it, to live it. And here Jesus was in the Sermon on the Mount, giving us some amazing things, but they sent something different. He didn't just say it, he lived it. The things he said, as this author said, he said in the sermon, he taught me to pray, our Father, forgive us our trespasses. But he himself never prayed that prayer. He said to those around him, if you then being evil, and then quietly he left himself out of that category. He made for righteousness sake and for my sake the same, identifying himself with the very righteousness of the universe. He implied that the phrase is, I never knew you, and doing the will of the Father were identical, and they meant the very same thing. High words, write this down, high words, yes, but there was nothing but harmony, nothing but harmony between those high words and his own high life. See, he talked a lofty talk, but he lived a lofty life. That's amazing. That is what gives it. You, you know the problem we have as Christians, and I'm just talking about our, our Christianity in general, we talk a great talk. It's just living up to it. Why is it that Christians in our world today aren't esteemed as greater because most people have heard the talk. They just haven't seen the walk. They've heard all this stuff. They know what Christians suppose. They know what Christians are supposed to be like. And whether they go to church or not, when you say you're a Christian, when you say you go to church, when you make any invitation to church, their expectations of you are higher than your expectations of yourself. And you know what? That's why a lot of people go, well, that's why I never tell people I'm Christian. You know, that's why I just try to live down here where I am. And that, that's kind of tough. But that's, I think, true. At least I'm not a hypocrite. Like if that solved everything. No, you're just scum. You're not a hypocrite. You're just scum. And so consequently, as we're going through life, we must understand if we're going to be like Christ, then we have to look at this and say, no, 
we have to live the life that Christ talked about in this. The scrutinizing, sifting centuries have seen no reason to alter what he said either about himself or about life. He is the Christ of the final word. Write these two phrases down. These I found were just too good to leave out. The Sermon on the Mount is the transcript of Jesus' mind and spirit. Jesus' mind and spirit. You want to know what Jesus was thinking? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Study the Sermon on the Mount. Digest the Sermon on the Mount. You want to know the spirit with which he lived? Study the Sermon on the Mount. Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. Make it who you are. Why? That is the mind and the spirit of Christ. Here's another one. There is nothing in the teachings of Christ which the subsequent growth of human knowledge will render obsolete. Maybe you've heard what they said I heard this one day, and I thought, this is really depressing for everybody going into college. It says, many things that people are going to learn their freshman year in college, by the time they graduate, they will have discovered that that no longer applies. Isn't that a scary thought? All of you college freshmen go, yeah, that's why I'm not learning anything this year, because I figure it's going to change anyway. I wouldn't follow that line very long but but it's true there's so much that we thought we knew and then all of a sudden oops that wasn't it and we learned something else but let me tell you something there's nothing about Jesus and nothing that Jesus taught that all the rest of the knowledge that we've accumulated since then has gone back and be able to say well what he said no longer applies because it still applies. Everything in the Sermon on the Mount, as you read it, everything about it still applies to today. It still applies to your life. It still applies to my life. It still applies to life in general. When Jesus spoke, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of how to have a blessed life, that life that possessed the joy that could not be affected by the circumstances around us, when he did that, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of focusing more on the interior attitudes than on the exterior actions, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of our spiritual disciplines and the way to receive the greatest and the most lasting rewards, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of focusing our attention on what really mattered in life, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke on relationships and the most effective way to relate to both God and others, he had the final word. When he spoke on the choices that each of us has to make between the narrow gate that leads to life and the broad gate that leads to hell, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of the fruit that we produce as evidence of who we really are, he had the final word. When Jesus spoke of listening and obeying his teachings, as the only security against the storms of life, I guarantee you, he had the final word. At the beginning of this series, I talked about this idea that we had a problem as Christians. Well, I'd like to finish with this idea. Christians, I have a dream. The other day, Dad and I were driving back from Jacksonville, funeral there. And as they were talking 
on NPR, they were talking about what things are said, what speeches have been given that truly changed history, that changed what was happening, that caused revolutions, that caused things to be different afterwards. And one of the things that they came up with was in the summer of 1963, when on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, a crowd gathered all along the reflecting pool that's there between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech that began a transformation of the cultural landscape of the United States. If you haven't gone back and listened to the whole speech, now most of us have heard the I have a dream part, the little part, the, the three men, I have a dream. You know, we, we got that down. Listen, it's only 16 minutes to listen to the whole thing if you get the ones where they've taken out all the applause. It's well worth listening to the whole thing. One of the most amazing things that was done, and I, and I find it very interesting. It was not titled, I Have a Complaint. Everybody's got a complaint. Tons of people had a complaint. I find it very interesting, and the thing that changed things was not the fact that he got up and gave a speech that said, I have a plan. Because a lot of people have plans. A lot of people can lay out what they think the plan is to change, and it doesn't change much of anything most of the time. What Martin Luther King did was to get up and gave a speech and said, I have a dream. The power of what he said lied in the painting of a picture of what life could be. If individuals, if families... If institutions lived up to what the signers of the Constitution and of what the Declaration of Independence and everything call the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With that speech in mind, as the backdrop, and with all due respect to Dr. King, I'd like to end this series of message with my dream my dream for what Christian could be. What Christian could be. I have a dream that one day everyone who calls Jesus their Savior would allow God's perfect love to flow through them and visibly transform their daily attitudes and their actions, perfecting their life in every area, perfecting his perfect love, perfecting their love. I have a dream that the life and love of Jesus lived out through each and every one of us will make everything and everyone around us better because that's what salt and light does. I have a dream that each of us will focus more on our internal attitudes and sins rather than simply on the external expectations of others because the way of love demands more than just outward expressions of it. I have a dream that we would all be more aware that we are being watched by the world around us but that our main audience is always God himself. Even when nobody else is watching, God is watching. I have a dream that every believer will make love for God and love for the things that God loves the main ambition for their life. And then they will trust God to take care of everything else that could clutter that ambition. I have a dream that each of us will value every relationship we have and extend the same grace that we would like to have extended to us 
when those relationships are damaged. I have a dream that everyone who enters our circle of influence will choose Jesus as the way. And that in doing so, will bear visible fruit of Christ being formed in them. I have a dream that those who hear Jesus' words would go beyond hearing to believing and obeying what Jesus says. And when all of that happens, the name Christian might recover that flavor it had back in the first century and that it would be synonymous and forever thought of together with this phrase, people who love everyone, everywhere, in every circumstance. Would you please bow your heads?